So what does Paul's letter have to say to us? In regards to sharing God's table, God's communion table, at the other tables where we sit during the week, work table, community table, neighborhood table, home table. Well, at first glance at this letter, it seems to place the emphasis of witness on the preacher man, Paul, right? It's Paul's job. And it's his great witness that grew up the Thessalonians and their faith. But let's wait a minute. The letter is not just from Paul. Notice how this letter comes from Paul, yes, and Silvanus and Timothy. And so this immediately dispels any temptation that we might have to make witness about the preacher man or the preacher woman. Isn't it? Paul's job, mission, to be the preacher, to be the witness? I mean, isn't that Heather's job, to, to be the witness on our behalf? I mean, isn't that why she went to seminary? Isn't that what we pay her for, to be our witness in Durham? Sharing God through my witness, it is my job, but not because my robe says reverend, but because my heart says hope. In Christ. The witness of God comes from the pulpit, yes, and from the pews, from the seminary, yes, and from the streets. The witness comes from Paul, yes, and Sylvanus and Timothy. The witness comes from Heather, yes, and Tad and Jim and Harriet. Oh, I see you all on the balcony. <laughs> But you all aren't let off either, right? Called to be witnesses, yes, Todd and Gaston and Mary Lee and Laura. Think back with me. Who was it? Actually, who all has God used? to be a witness in your life. Because I'm going to imagine that many of your stories, they're similar to mine. It wasn't that it was one person that witnessed to me this incredible faith that I have stepped into. It's that many people have witnessed and word and oftentimes just as powerfully in action over the years. Some people that I met on a street, no name, don't know their name, but what they did spoke like more powerfully than any sermon I'd heard. And some of those witnesses of the faith in my life are people that I, I call mentor or spouse or parent. And so it is that so many of us have so many people in our lives who have been the ones to bring us into our faith yes, right here this morning, our yes to God. You know, I was thinking about this this morning. In Sunday school class, I opened us uh, in prayer. And I began by praying over the train whistle that I heard in the background. Um, and I paused. And right when I paused, the train whistle went off again, as if on cue. And in that moment for our group, I recognized that that whistle was uh, more powerful of a witness to God showing up than even my own words were in that moment. And that baby that we just heard shout out its own version of amen in the midst of the children's moment, right? A powerful witness that none of us planned, but that speaks. So how can it be, though, that a train whistle or a baby crying can be that which witnesses to our faith? Well, Paul says this in verse 5, that the message of the gospel didn't come to you just in speech, just in words, just in a sermon, but also with power and the Holy Spirit and with deep conviction. These three things are related. Power, say power. power. Spirit, say spirit. spirit. And conviction, say conviction. conviction. They're all related and we, as we look at Paul's letters. For again and again, the power that Paul writes about is associated with God's power. In Romans, God's power through creation. In Corinthians, God's power through the resurrection of Jesus and in Jesus' miracles. God's power is that which accompanies our witness. 
God's power, turns these words on a piece of paper into more than words, into that which can be a witness. A baby's cry turned into a witness through God's power. And it is the Holy Spirit, say Spirit, which confirms in our hearts and in our minds that what we are hearing, that the witness that we are hearing is the Word of God. The Holy Spirit offers us assurance and thereby enables us to receive the witness with conviction. Say conviction. conviction. Even when we still have our doubts, even when there seems to be a lot of obstacles in the way of our faith. Therein lies the definition of a faith witness. Our witness is not about our power. It is not showing what we can do for God. That is not what our witness, our faith witness is. Being a witness is showing and telling what God has done already in our lives. It's what Chris just did. Pointing into our lives and saying, look what God has done. And then pointing into the life of somebody else and saying, do you recognize God? Do you realize in these different ways how God is already present with you? Paul and his friends, they point to their own life. Look what Christ has done. And God's power opens the hearts of the Thessalonians. The Holy Spirit confirms their yes. And they, without all the answers, only three weeks to the faith, are convicted and begin to go out and witness. Verse 6. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, writes Paul, when you accepted the message that came from the Holy Spirit with joy in spite of your suffering. They became imitators of those who were imitating Christ. How? When? By accepting the message with joy right in the middle of their suffering. In spite of their suffering. I stood at a hospital bed this week with somebody who knows that it's a mass. And they're waiting for the test results. What can I pray for, I asked. And I expected them to ask what I would ask for. Please pray that it won't be cancer. But instead, they said this. I believe that God will heal me no matter what the test results say. I believe that God will heal me even if there's not a cure. And so pray, Heather, for my healing. You became an imitator when you accepted the message with joy in spite of suffering. This person told me, it doesn't mean that I am not anxious and that I am not scared. I'm scared. And yet, what an incredible witness, joy and peace in the midst of suffering. Now, I have to tell you, I do get a little nervous when we start to compare our suffering to that of Paul's and the Thessalonians, for in truth, few if any of us will ever experience the level of persecution that they may have faced. And yet, our world is broken, isn't it? And we do suffer every day in different ways. And yet, we suffer in this world with an invitation to share God's table, right? To share the soul food that heals broken hearts. That redeems messiness. That comes smack in the middle of the suffering. Not once we figure out our suffering or get past our suffering or fix our suffering, if that is even possible, and most times it is not. It looks like this, doesn't it? <laughs> Life out of death, hope out of waste, resurrection in the midst of the cross. I believe I will be healed no matter what the test results say. For God always heals even if there is no cure. Pray for me, 
then for my healing. You became an imitator when you accepted the message with joy in spite of suffering. This kind of joy, friends, that I'm talking about, it's more than the happiness that comes with the so-called good life. This kind of joy is instilled deep in our souls, rooted in a strength that only God gives and God's promises allow. Joy from the news that God is good and that righteousness prevails and that nothing in life or in death can defeat the one who trusts in God. Joy that witnesses past these walls and to each other here, to a broken world, and allows God to change lives, other lives, and in the process my own. For I have never witnessed to my faith and not myself been renewed, strengthened, changed. What has God's power done in your life since you first believed? I'm almost there. Oh, now I've lost him. It's okay. Lord, no, okay. But now you're awake, aren't you? And that's a good thing. What has God's power done in your life since you first believed? Go then and be my witnesses. But I don't want to, God. I'm uncomfortable with it. And I don't know enough. And what if I mess up? Right? I say that. So here's the truth. Every single one of you sitting here, including myself, we are all already witnesses. We witness all day long every day to different things. And here's where that slide comes. Because we witness with our passion in our t-shirts to our favorite sports team. Oh, jump pass touchdown yesterday. Went over Virginia. We witness with our time, right, to our priorities. We witness with our money to our loyalties. And we witness with our actions and words to our faith or lack thereof. You see, maybe, maybe that's why Jesus, his last words are not, you will be witnesses. His last words are, you will be my witnesses. Not you will be witnesses, but you will be my witnesses. So the question this morning, friends, is not will you witness. The question this morning is to whom or to what do you witness? To whom or to what do you witness? What are you testifying to at your work table, at your family table? With your priorities, your actions, your words. And if it's not Christ, primarily, if it's not testifying to that kind of joy that is more than happiness with the good life, well then, how's that working out for you? How's that working out for the people that sit with you at those tables? The, uh, the doorbell rang, I'm going to use the handheld, this will work. The doorbell rang at 4.30 this Wednesday here at church. And I answered the door, and there was a woman standing there holding a two-year-old child. That child was fast asleep. And um, she said, I'm here to ask about your preschool. You see, my situation is unique. We're going to be here for one month at a time every other month for the next six months. Because you see, my mom has been accepted at Duke for a lung transplant. And it will be a six month journey. We're from Orlando, Florida. I have four children. I, I, I'm vice president of administrations at a hospital. And I'm also the one that created this family schedule so that my mother will never be here alone. One of us will always be with her. I wrote down the information for her on our preschool. And then I asked, can we pray? And she said, yes, please. And so we prayed for her mother, and we prayed for her family, and we prayed for safe travels back and forth um, to, to Orlando, to here. Uh, we prayed for the person that doesn't even know that it'll be their lung. 
that she receives. We were walking out together, and she said to me, I asked my mother, Mom, if you were cured right now, this very moment, if you were cured right now, what would you do? And her mom said, I would go and tell. I would go to other sick people and tell them that there is hope. And she looked at her mom and she said, then why aren't you doing that right now? 